Today's podcast is brought to you by Leatherman Data Services. Leathermans provide mapping and geographic data services, and they are history fans. Even better, they're history podcast fans. So if you have a project, a paper, or a presentation, and you think your information would be expressed more clearly with a high-quality map, then go to leathermandataservices.com to find out more. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 46, The Last War. Thank you so much for your patience during the delay to this episode. I will talk more about that at the end of this story. Since the overthrow of Maurice in 602, every Roman strategist's nightmare had come true. Attacked in east and west simultaneously, the empire had been stripped of all its outer provinces. The Balkans had been surrendered to the chaotic advance of Slavs and Avars. The east had been systematically occupied by the highly organized Persians. The new effective borders of Romania were the Long Walls of Thrace and the Taurus Mountains in Anatolia. And neither of those frontiers were entirely secure. Staring out of the palace windows at this bleak scenario was the Emperor Heraclius. What was he thinking? What was he feeling? Those questions are at the heart of this episode. We can never really know what someone from the ancient world was like. Obviously, time and distance, and then the biases and assumptions of historians, colour them in, turning them into caricatures that we just hope are vaguely accurate. But even with all those understood caveats, I feel like we got a sense of who Justinian was. Because we have writing by him and about him, we have buildings he put up, we have details of the wars he started and why, we have writing from people who met him talking about what he was like. We don't really have a lot to go on when it comes to Heraclius, not personal sources like that. I've talked about the Christian history, the Paschal Chronicle. We also have a history written by Theophanes the Confessor, a Byzantine monk writing in the 800s AD. He was using earlier sources in compiling his work, but these are histories with a Christian perspective and no particular first-hand knowledge of Heraclius' personality. They stress what you would expect them to, that Heraclius was a good emperor, a great strategist, and a pious man of God. We don't even have contemporary Persian histories to look to for clues, because soon enough the armies of Islam will appear, and uh, any budding Persian historians will have their hands full with that. What we want, of course, is another Procopius, someone who knew the emperor personally and could give us that kind of insight. And frustratingly, in a way, we have one. We have George of Pisidia. Pisidia being an area in southwest Anatolia. George was a deacon in the Hagia Sophia who worked for the Patriarch Sergius. But George was also a budding poet, and he went on campaign with Heraclius and wrote an epic poem about what he saw. Unlike Procopius, though, George doesn't emulate Herodotus or Thucydides in his work. Instead, he's channeling Homer and Virgil. So, although his poems are extremely valuable in telling us what happened, they don't get us much closer to Heraclius the man. Almost all ancient histories, including Procopius, feature passages which we suspect may be entirely made up. Because the legacy of Homer was so strong in the Greek-speaking world, it seems like just recounting tactical cavalry battles would be of no satisfaction to an audience back home. So, during the episodes on Justinian and Belisarius, I left out accounts of Gothic noblemen who killed 12 Roman soldiers single-handedly before finally being brought down, or indeed of single combat being suggested to decide a whole battle. George of Pisidia recounts plenty of these moments. In fact, if we took his account and based the podcast on that, we would get the 300 version of Heraclius. You know the movie 300, which gives a very entertaining but highly exaggerated account of the Battle of Thermopylae. Within his writing, 
George compares the emperor to Perseus, Orpheus, Moses, Elijah, and Christ himself. And he also uses gushing analogies of the wise helmsman, the indulgent parent, the caring doctor, and even the sun shining in winter. And this is our first-hand source, so we have to be very careful in picking through the information we have to try and glimpse, or more likely guess, what the real Heraclius was like. I hope today we can at least explore the possibilities. I'm not going to pretend to zero in on the truth. I just want to see if we can't use common sense and the sources we have to think about what the emperor might have been going through. And that's why today's episode is one giant podcast. I feel like we can't get an accurate sense of what the emperor went through if I break up the story into half-hour installments. He didn't know how long this war would last. It had already been going on for 20 years at this point. And he went into this final phase not knowing if he was about to be crushed and left dead in some distant field, or if it was all going to turn out okay, or indeed if his maneuverings were going to bring no results and the war was going to drag on for another decade or another decade beyond that. So today we're going to go with him all the way to the war's end to try and keep a sense of perspective on how things were unfolding from his point of view. So far on the podcast, I suppose I've presented Heraclius as somewhat smooth. You know, the way he engineered the civil war to best suit his chances of emerging victorious. And then once he's in power, he manages to shore up his legitimacy, remove rivals, dodge the blame for all the terrible defeats he was suffering. And there must be some accuracy in that, because Heraclius was successful. He did seize power, he kept it, he avoided assassination. But maybe I'm wrong in thinking that he was in some way cold. You know, when I talked about the cancelling of the bread doll, I followed the line that Heraclius deliberately threatened to go back to Carthage to make this bitter pill less hard to swallow. It's terrible that we won't be fed anymore, but at least the emperor isn't abandoning us. But maybe I'm wrong. The histories record that Heraclius was melancholy, that he was genuinely distraught at the loss of Syria and Egypt, and that he feared Constantinople might be next. Maybe he was homesick in that environment. Maybe the decision to return to Carthage was an emotional one, and not a cool trick to keep the masses on side during a time of great sacrifice. We don't know, but the part about him being a strategist seems to be confirmed by what happened next. So let's focus on what we do know. It's now the autumn of 621, and having got the church to surrender its gold and silver to help pay for the army, the emperor left Constantinople and went to the palace in Hieria, just across the Bosphorus. He went to escape the daily court rituals and petitions from people, and he spent that winter reading and planning. He had to figure out how to reclaim lost provinces and defeat the so far unbeatable Persian army. It seems likely that Constantinople would have been filled with refugees. Whole families must have fled from Egypt and Syria and Palestine, as well as all the cities in Anatolia. The Persians had just sacked a bunch of key cities there, including Chalcedon, just across the waters from the capital. So surely many people would be heading to Constantinople for some comfort and begging through any connections they had with the imperial bureaucracy to get them rehoused somewhere safe. And at the same time, the bread coming from Alexandria had just been cut off. So you can imagine the city was a fairly desperate and noisy place to be right now. Heraclius needed to get away to think clearly. Over in the palace... He called on all the advisers and any military minds he could find to take advice. He probably also tried to get hold of merchants or other traders who still had contact with the East to find out what they knew about the Persian occupation. Of course, that was a two-way street. There must have been fear that Persian spies lurked amongst the teeming masses. And I think this is something we all need to remember, that the, the war has been going on for 20 years. And it's easy to forget when listening to a podcast that people's lives were being disrupted and sometimes destroyed on a daily basis for two decades. Now, things may have been quieter 
every winter when the armies went home, but every spring and summer, those same armies were coming back and marching across Anatolia and the east. So there must have been young men who had grown up knowing nothing but constant warfare. And if your family owned a farm anywhere near a major road, the chances are that your produce has been stolen or requisitioned repeatedly by both sides. So who's to say what someone out there, a loyal Roman Christian citizen, wouldn't do for some cash at this stage? You know, or what about the Jews or the Armenians who work within the empire? Could Heraclius be sure of their loyalties? It was a time of paranoia amongst those crowds who, who lurked, who might hold some key to a future campaign. It seems likely Heraclius got out his history books as well and read about previous campaigns in the East. Was there something he could learn from Trajan or Septimius Severus or Julian about what to do or not to do? Top of that reading list would have been the Strategicon, possibly written by Maurice, who had only just recently defeated the Sassanids and filled with practical tips on their weaknesses. And the Persians did have weaknesses. I know that you as History of Rome listeners understand the basic problem of a siege. You know, you surround a city with your army, and now the people inside can't bring food in, so eventually they will starve to death. But it's not that simple, right? Because you still have to feed your army, and you have to send them out to find food, and you can't leave the siege even for a day, or else the people inside the city will get out. So there's a balance that's always struck in that scenario. And in 621, the same sort of scenario was playing out with the Persian occupation of the Eastern Mediterranean. Yes, the Persians were undefeated and had taken all of those provinces, but they now had to hold them. You can't capture a city like Alexandria with, let's just say, 100,000 inhabitants and not leave troops behind. Now, the Persians were smart. They let local Egyptian men run the city, and local Egyptians collect the taxes and tried to let life go on as before. But how many men do you need to keep 100,000 people quiet? 5,000? 10,000? Even if you leave a garrison on the lower end, you'd still need some men in the nearby towns, just in case, right? Well, now think about Antioch, Jerusalem, Theodosiopolis, Amida, Emesa, Damascus, Martyropolis, Dara. How many soldiers who were recently out in the field winning you battles do you now need to leave in these Byzantine cities? And it's not like the Persians could easily enroll Christian Romans into their armies and force them to fight against their brethren. The Persians had dealt the Byzantines a massive blow, but they had lost their maneuverability. They couldn't march on Constantinople tomorrow without risking all their newly won territory from going into revolt. And that's where Heraclius began to see his opportunity. If he tried to reclaim the lost provinces town by town, he would suffer from the same weakness. Let's say he gathers his forces and goes marching into Antioch and smashes Shavaraz aside and retakes the city. Now he's got to leave men there to guard it. And so on, and so on. He can't afford to do that. The emperor's lost so many men that he can't break up what's left of his army. He has to keep it together. But maybe if he bypasses the Persian garrisons and marches into Persia itself, then he can cause enough damage to force Khusro to negotiate some kind of peace. It seems like his best bet. Obviously, he prioritizes the east over the west. Although the Slavs and Avars had taken Roman provinces too, those areas were less wealthy and less populated. And as ever, the Romans knew the organized Persians were the more dire threat than barbarians that could be bought off for now. And that's what Heraclius decided to do next. If he was going to campaign in the east, then he needed every available man. And that meant ordering what was left of the Balkan armies to get on a boat and cross the Bosphorus. There would be no field army troops left in Thrace, which of course was like an open invitation for the Avars to come raiding into that still prosperous part of the empire. Not to mention that it left the road open 
to Constantinople itself. Heraclius wasn't going to leave the Avars to do as they please, so he sent word to the Kargan that he wanted to talk peace, and negotiations for a truce began. That sound effect will mark the change from one year to the next. And just to be clear, I'm going by our calendar. So December is the end of the year. In spring 622, Heraclius made his way to Anatolia to take a look at what remained of the Roman army. There would have been units left from all of the armies of the empire, from Thrace, Illyricum, Armenia, the east, and those in the emperor's presence. They would now all be melded together into one field army. The army of Africa did remain where it was to defend against any potential Persian attack, but for all intents and purposes, the army that Heraclius was putting together was the only Roman army left in the world. Just think about that for a moment. As Heraclius looked on at the camp being built, he must have realized that if this army was destroyed, it was all over. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire would have shown that the West fell in 476 and the East only lasted another 150 more years. We saw in the episode on the Strategicon that unit cohesion and complicated battlefield drills were by now the key to Roman military success. And so time was needed to create new legions and new divisions that could work together effectively. Particularly as some of these men were from completely different parts of the empire. The author of the Strategicon would have been very pleased to see Heraclius begin any military endeavor with a strong focus on training. And apparently the emperor went so far as to split his forces into opposing camps and set up a mock battle in which they could test their new configurations. But while preparing them physically, Heraclius did not want to ignore the mental side of combat. He would have known from experience, advice, and everything he'd read, that morale was the underpinning of every army. And with only one army left, Heraclius could not afford for them to turn and run. Doubtless he tried to encourage bonding and a sense of togetherness, and his own presence as their commander-in-chief must have helped reinforce the message that we are all in this together. But the tool which the histories report him using the most was Christianity. In the 300 version of Heraclius' life, he gives a great speech to inspire his men, talking about how the Persians are heathens who worship fire and had defiled Christian churches across the East, and how God was the true commander of the army who would lead them to victory and revenge. Now, he may not have given that exact speech, but it's entirely likely that he spread that sort of patriotic rah-rah message to help forge a common purpose amongst his men. Heraclius had never been shy about using Christian symbols in his imperial career. In fact, when he sailed from Constantinople to meet up with his troops, he again fixed an icon of the Virgin Mary to his ship, just as he had done during the Civil War. But the 300 version, or the George of Pisidia version of the story, presents Heraclius as God's champion, almost like a new Moses leading his people to a new promised land of victory. Or more specifically, in this case, David fighting the Persian Goliath. In reality, I wonder if Heraclius ever questioned his own faith. I don't really mean that the way we think of it today. In our society, we separate spiritual matters very clearly from practical ones. So when we talk about matters of faith, we refer to a very specific area of thought about God or the supernatural. And I don't think that kind of separation was possible for Heraclius. There weren't atheists around the way there are today to lay out a vision of a world with no creator. But one of the overriding beliefs of the ancient world, whether pagan, Christian, or whatever, was that the divine played a part in who succeeded and who didn't. And this had been true for thousands of years, and belief in this idea had helped with the transition of Christianity becoming the state religion of the Romans. Augustus and Jesus had been contemporaries. Coincidence, or a sign that the one true God needed a powerful human realm to safeguard his truths. So what was Heraclius to think, 
when the Persians, Avars and Slavs lifted province after province from his hands. Why had God abandoned him? Was he punishing him for his actions, or the Roman people for theirs? Was he rewarding the Monophysites for their piety? Remember that the Persians were now allowing exclusively Monophysite hierarchies to govern many eastern cities. These are all my 21st century guesses, of course. I'm sure any thought process that the emperor actually had was a thousand times more nuanced than that. But I think it's interesting to consider that while the propagandists trumpet Heraclius's resolve, we are left to wonder what thoughts occupied his mind as he stared down at the last Roman army in the world and considered the consequences of failure. As ever, trying to guess how large this army was has kept historians busy for many years. In theory, there would have been about 125,000 men in the field armies on the day that Maurice died. There were, of course, limitanii or border soldiers and town militias that could help with garrisoning, and some troops must have been left behind to guard key cities and positions. But the best guess is that the army was about 50,000 men strong. That's the largest size it seems likely could be fed and supplied from Anatolia, and perhaps the maximum size that one man could realistically command. Heraclius wanted a large force, of course, but he also wanted an army he could move fairly quickly. The Persians, meanwhile, were still on the move. They now had two major frontiers with the Byzantines, the Armenian Mountains and the Taurus Mountains. Across the Tauruses was Cilicia, which led down into Syria. Shavaraz had taken the lead in conquering this area, and many of his men would have been occupying the key Roman cities of the east, along with the famous Cilician Gates, the narrow pass through which most traffic into Syria had to travel. However, he still had an army capable of raiding, and had crossed into Roman territory during the summer to plunder northeastern Anatolia, and keep up the pressure on his enemy. When his preparations were complete, Heraclius led his reformed army east, aiming to force Shavaraz out of Anatolia. I can only imagine this must have been a time of terrible anxiety for the emperor. He had led an army into battle already, you may recall, just outside Antioch, and had been beaten by Shavaraz. Now that the situation was so desperate, he had to take up personal command again. With him standing alongside them, his men would not miss the point that failure was not an option, and he'd probably realised that if another general succeeded at this point, then that man might be swept into office. So high were the stakes of this particular game. Heraclius was about 46 or 47 years old at this time. I wonder how he was holding up physically. He may have felt an urgency to campaign soon, before his own strength left him. What happened next is hard to describe easily. It seems like both Heraclius and Shavaraz knew that the terrain was crucial for each side's chance of victory. And I want to be specific about the type of country these manoeuvres took place in. I'm sure you all have a basic understanding of where things are at this stage. Cappadocia begins very roughly in the centre of Anatolia, the centre of modern Turkey, and then going east, you move into Armenia with Pontus to the north in Roman territory and Syria to the south if you left the mountains. But when I talk about Cappadocia and Armenia being mountainous, you need to think of being literally up in the mountains most of the time. Don't think of rolling hills. Think of being a thousand meters above sea level. Think of steep hills all around you, sudden river valleys dropping away, salt lakes, sometimes surrounded by forest, other times by arid rocks. Even though modern Armenia is not in the same place as Armenia was in 622 AD, if you do a Google image search for Armenian landscape, you will get some idea of what it looked like. And and that type of landscape ran from the middle of Anatolia throughout Armenia and the Caucasus and into Persian territory, so it should help with imagining the coming battles. This was hard terrain, and the Romans and Persians were looking to choose a battlefield that would give them the advantage. In general, the Persians would prefer open country because they had more experience in this landscape and better cavalry. 
The Roman soldier was usually better trained for hand-to-hand combat, and so might prosper if he could catch his enemy in rocky climbs, where cavalry couldn't easily operate. But then again, the Romans were always looking for a completely flat plain where they could deploy their whole army in formation. And in this case, the Romans outnumbered Shavaraz's forces. We don't have accurate information about Persian numbers, but it seems likely that Shavaraz would have had less than 30,000 men for such a raid. That's not to say that Heraclius had all 50,000 with him in one spot, but that gives you a very rough idea of who we're dealing with. This also brings in another element of Heraclius' personality that we can only speculate about. We don't know, but historians seem to think that Heraclius Sr. was Armenian. He had fought for Maurice in this region during the 580s, and we don't know where our Heraclius was. Is it possible he followed his father around this terrain? Even as a child, did he pick up ideas and understanding, and perhaps some of the language? Could some of his confidence about leading the army come from familiarity with the battlefield? At this stage, Shavaraz was to the north, and tried to force battle with the Romans somewhere in Cappadocia. But Heraclius kept manoeuvring away, never willing to risk fighting until he was completely ready. It seems like this tango went on for most of the summer, until the sides had swapped places, with the Romans now occupying ground to the north, and Shavaraz content to push south from where he could easily head home to Cilicia for the winter. As autumn approached, though, Heraclius marched east, towards Persian-held Armenia. Shavaraz seems to have been surprised by this and marched north to stop the Romans from invading. As the camps got closer together, George of Pisidia claims that he got information on the Persian camp and that while Shavaraz was entertained by dancing girls, the pious emperor Heraclius loved nothing more than hearing a good psalm being read. Hmm... Heraclius found a plane he was happy to fight on, but even then was still working hard to gain every possible advantage for his men. He encountered a scouting party of Arabs who were working for the Persians, and once they were captured, he treated them kindly to get intelligence from them and enrolled them in his own ranks. Once the Persians reached the plain, the emperor went even further, apparently having a banquet prepared in the open, inviting the Persians to attack while his men tried to look like they weren't prepared. Shavaraz wasn't going to take that bait, and in fact concealed a force of his own nearby to try and spring a surprise. But the following day, the men were noticed, driven off, and the battle began. The flat plain allowed the Romans to deploy their formations and limit the damage from Persian arrow fire, which was their chief defensive weapon. Once the forces collided full on, the Romans quickly got the better of the Persians, who retreated. Most of the Persian army made a sensible withdrawal from the area, with Shavaraz able to maintain some cohesion. But those who fled the wrong way were chased by the Byzantines, who hunted them, in the words of George of Pisidia, like wild goats. The victory was a minor one, but the effect on Roman morale was tremendous. It was the first Byzantine victory for over a decade, and Heraclius must have breathed a huge sigh of relief when the day was over. Strategically, he had also pushed the Persians out of Anatolia, which would provide peace for his men during the winter. Which was just as well, because soon after the battle, word reached Heraclius that the Avars were marching toward Constantinople. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, we don't know many details about, or even the name of, the Avar Kagan. We don't know if he looked at the calamities which the Byzantines were suffering with an eye for vengeance, or all those defeats that his people had suffered during the last years of Maurice's reign, or whether this was just pure opportunism. You know, the Romans were the Avar's neighbours, they were usually enemies, The chance to take all of the Balkans and possibly Constantinople was a very tempting proposition. But we don't know anything about this particular man, so whatever the makeup of his personality, he had watched 
As over the past decade, the Roman presence in the Balkans had shrunk to nothing, and soon after the last troops had left Thrace, diplomats had come before him, saying that Heraclius wanted peace and was willing to pay for it. And it's a mark of how seriously Heraclius took the Avar threat to Constantinople that he was willing to spend his precious church plate melted coins on securing their cooperation. It's difficult to know whether the Persians had any direct contact with the Khagan during this time, but clearly the chief of the Avars knew that with the Byzantines fully occupied in the east, he had the best opportunity he would ever have of destroying the empire. Now, if he could gain control of Constantinople, it would not only make him the rival of Attila in the history of western steppe nomads, but it would utterly alter his people's way of life. Out on the Hungarian plain, the Avars were always going to be at war, in part because resources could be scarce if bad harvests came in, but also just to keep their subordinate tribes and peoples in check. You know, just like the Huns, they uh, gathered people that they you know, overran or conquered and said, you, you work for us now, you follow in our train. But if he were to capture Constantinople and his seat of government was now the greatest city in the known world with walls and bureaucrats ready to go out and run things for him, well, that would be a very different proposition. So in the autumn of 622, the Kargan began letting his men off their leashes and raided south of the Danube. Heraclius spent a restless winter and spring, 623, working out how best to appease them. He was determined not to transfer troops back to Europe and lose the base he now had over in Cappadocia. So the emperor turned to some other famous Byzantine diplomatic tricks. In addition to financial subsidy, which he knew the Kargan would want, Heraclius decided to try and wow the Avars with a display of the wonders of Roman civilization. He sent for the Deems, who dispatched some of their best entertainers and charioteers. The emperor was going to set up a small circus spectacular for the Kargan. The two men would sit side by side, eating and drinking, and delight in the skills of the performers. With this display of the value of the Roman world, and with the Kargan treated like a friend and equal, and suitably weighed down with gifts, I'm sure, well, how could he refuse to become our friend? The show was to take place at the town of Heraclea, which lay just outside the long walls of Thrace, about 65 miles from Constantinople. The first of today's maps shows the environs of the capital, you can find that on Facebook or at thehistoryofbyzantium.com, and it's all hail C. Placidus as ever for the map. The Deemsman went on ahead to set things up, while Heraclius stayed behind the walls at Selimbria until he got word of the Kargan's arrival. Presumably the Emperor did take a personal guard with him, and he may have had some Limitanii soldiers in the area, but nothing comparable to what the Kargan could field. It was June 623 when the Kargan arrived with his retinue. The Kargan had no intention of being wowed. Instead, he intended to kidnap the emperor. The Kargan himself made for Heraclea, but sent a detachment of men to hide in the woodlands that overlooked the long walls to wait for the emperor to emerge. Heraclius was soon informed of the situation. Men spotted the Avars and rushed to warn him. The emperor had already begun preparations to head out to the entertainment site, but immediately realized the severity of the situation. He tore off his imperial cloaks and grabbed the nearest ragged peasant gear he could find before leaping on his horse and racing at full speed for Constantinople. Seeing the commotion below, the Avars realized what must have happened and burst out of their hiding places, broke through the long walls and chased the emperor back to the capital. I've included a fun artist's impression of this scene along with the maps, but the Avars never got anywhere near Heraclius. Once safely inside the city, he ordered the Theodosian walls to be manned, and the Avar troop stopped short and took out their frustrations on the suburbs. The Avars carried off many prisoners in the following week, including the unfortunate members of the Blues and Greens at Heraclea. With this terrifying experience behind him, Heraclius was more determined than ever to agree a truce with the Avars. He had no way of knowing how long his campaigns in the east would last. It had taken the Persians a decade to conquer those provinces, 
could take another ten to free them, and he could not afford Constantinople to be threatened while he was gone. So peace with the Avars must be attained. Negotiations took place throughout 623, while Heraclius paced up and down inside the palace, and his army in the east kept a watchful eye on the horizon. In the end, the price of peace was to be 200,000 gold coins a year, or 2,777 pounds of gold. And yes, that was more than Attila had received in one year. I imagine Heraclius didn't pay it all in one go, though. He had zero reason to trust the Avars at this point, and the truce did not secure the return of Byzantine prisoners or stop the Avars from living south of the Danube. So whether Heraclius thought it would stick, we don't know. It's hard to imagine what would have happened had the Avars captured Heraclius. One shudders at the thought of hostage demands being sent to Heraclius' 11-year-old son, who would technically have been the next in line. Come the spring of 624, young Heraclius Constantine, who from now on we'll just call Constantine, Constantine III, if that helps, had to face the reality of being heir to the throne of Byzantium. With the Avar truce shakily in place, the emperor was determined to get back to the east and invade Persia. Anticipating a long campaign, Heraclius wanted his wife Martina to go with him, but his son to remain behind. Martina was not the mother of young Constantine. You'll recall that his mother died when he was very young, and Martina was, of course, Heraclius' niece. This would all leave an 11-year-old boy at home on the throne, knowing that if his father died out in the east, he would be emperor of a probably crumbling empire. I cannot imagine how that would feel. In charge of the actual day-to-day running of the city would be two men. The patriarch Sergius, by now a close ally of the emperors and a man with the necessary authority amongst the populace, and another trusted friend, Bonus, the master of soldiers in the emperor's presence, such as there were left. Obviously, Heraclius must have trusted these men, because he was leaving his heir behind under their protection. And by abandoning the capital, possibly for years, the chances for a coup would be greatly increased. Now, from our point of view, it makes sense for the emperor to go on campaign. And of course, it doesn't seem that abnormal if you've just marathoned your way through the History of Rome podcast. Leading Roman men campaigned all the time. But we should remember that for centuries now in the East, particularly centered around Constantinople, that was not normal behavior. You know, no, almost none of the emperors since Theodosius had even, you know, left the capital for very long. The emperor stayed at home and was therefore always on hand to deal with any problems there. He could never be killed or kidnapped by barbarians because he never went near them. So people were very anxious when they realized that Heraclius was leaving and that he didn't plan on coming back soon. After Easter services, where everyone in the Hagia Sophia offered sincere prayers for Heraclius' success, he departed for the east, perhaps wondering if he would ever see the city again. Once he arrived at Caesarea, the city in Cappadocia, the emperor made his army purify itself for three days to get right with God before their adventures began, or at least that's what George of Pisidia claimed. If I haven't mentioned it already, George would publish his poem back in Constantinople for the glorification of the emperor after the war. By May, the last Roman army was on the move and headed straight for Persian Armenia, you can find another helpful map with all the movements of Heraclius' army across the next few years in the usual places. This is also picked up from Wikipedia, but put together by Mohammed Adil. And I've also reposted a C. Placidus map from episode 11, which is useful in showing the topography of the area. Heraclius' strategy was to bypass the Persian garrisons of Syria and march through the Armenian mountains to threaten Persian territory on the other side. In order to defend themselves, the Persians would be forced to pull troops away from their newly won provinces and hopefully realize the difficulty in trying to hold on to it all. They would then agree to a peace treaty that restored the provinces to Byzantium, 
But Heraclius knew in order to achieve this, he had to cause maximum damage, not hold on to much territory himself, keep his army together at all times, and of course, not lose. Simple, right? Once his army was properly equipped and provisioned, Heraclius led them out and marched purposefully into Armenia. The first stop on the journey was Theodosiopolis, the former capital of Byzantine Armenia. The city was quickly assaulted and retaken, which would give Heraclius something of a base camp to head for should things turn sour. But as soon as the city was secure, the emperor marched on. Crossing deep into eastern Armenia, the emperor advanced on Duvin, the capital of Persian Armenia. The Persians seemed to have been taken by surprise by the emperor's sudden advance into their territory. They had been largely quiet over the past two years, and had perhaps concluded that the Roman army near Caesarea would come for Syria if it was going anywhere. The garrison of Duvin were certainly surprised to see thousands of Romans on their doorstep, somewhere the Romans hadn't been for more than a century. Again, Heraclius' men made short work of the defenders and sacked the city. Many Persian and Armenian captives were taken and marched along with the army. Now that Heraclius had Khusro's attention, he turned his army south and entered Persian territory. Ravaging the land and taking more captives as he went, the emperor invaded the province of Atropatine. We are still in mountainous terrain, where the emperor clearly felt confident that he could outmaneuver any Persian force sent against him. But he was aiming for the city of Ganzak, the capital of the province, and the site of one of the King of Kings' regional palaces. Ganzak also had another feature that made it an ideal target for Heraclius' raid. Next to Khusro's palace was a Zoroastrian fire temple. I haven't talked much about Zoroastrianism, the traditional religion of the Persian people and uh, certainly the, the state religion of the Sasanids. Um, it hasn't been directly relevant to our story on this podcast, and I'm sure the History of Iran podcast will do a much better job than I ever could. But very briefly, Zoroastrianism saw the universe as a struggle between the forces of good and evil. The followers of goodness must try to be good in order to keep chaos at bay. But in terms of ritual behavior, fire and water were considered agents of purity, and both would be represented within Zoroastrian temples. The Sasanids in particular seem to have promoted the use of fire temples as a way to associate their regime with religious belief and perhaps direct religious behavior in a similar way that we've seen the Byzantines do. Three great fire temples existed at this time, whose flames were said to derive directly from the creation of the world. They were tended to by Zoroastrian priests and venerated by the people. As you would expect, tales of miracles that happened at those sites were widely spread, and one of those flames, that of Adur Gushnasp, burnt inside the Ganzak fire temple. It seems that this particular temple was closely associated with the Sasanid regime, new king of kings would sometimes make a pilgrimage there after their coronation. Heraclius knew that to force Khusro to the negotiating table, he had to inflict maximum damage. And in the Ganzak fire temple, he saw a golden opportunity. By now, Khusro II was of course fully aware of this large Roman army marching through his territory. And when the emperor turned south, the king of kings realized where he was headed and leapt into action. Apparently gathering an army of 40,000 men, Khusro made his way to Ganzak before the Romans got there. However, the Roman scouts so utterly routed their Persian counterparts that the king of kings began to panic about what defeat might mean. An emperor and a king of kings probably hadn't been this physically close to one another since Julian died on retreat from Tassiphon, and Khusro knew better than to make a stand when he still held all the cards. The Shah and Shah bid a hasty retreat as Heraclius' army closed in on the city. His army went with him, and the Romans sacked Ganzak. George of Pisidia has Heraclius entering the fire temple and seeing a statue of Khusro surrounded by winged figures representing the sun, moon, and stars, and this blasphemy enraged the Christian emperor who ordered the temple destroyed. 
He then had his men torture nearby town, which was said to be the birthplace of Zoroaster. That latter part seems unlikely for various reasons, but the sack of Ganzak was real enough, and the inclusion of the emperor's fury and the attack on the birthplace of the Zoroastrian faith were inserted to make it clear that the Romans had exacted vengeance for Shavaraz's sack of Jerusalem in 614. Now, no doubt many in the Roman army were thirsty for vengeance, but I suspect Heraclius, far from furious at the unchristianness of the temple, was delighted at such a PR coup and personal blow for his counterpart. The Persian army had retreated with their king, and the Romans were soon following, capturing another of the royal palaces on the way. But at this point, Heraclius had decisions to make. No Roman army had been this far east for many a century. And the Byzantine sources claim that Heraclius wanted to march on Tessaphon and end the war right there. But winter was coming, and 40,000 Persians were presumably waiting for them across the Zagros Mountains, the range which separates Iran from Iraq today. It seems more likely that Ganzak was roughly as far as Heraclius had planned on campaigning. Everything had gone as well as could be expected. Now he needed somewhere for his army to rest and recuperate. Doubtless many had died or been wounded, so new recruits would be ideal as well. Rather than march all the way home, the emperor turned north and headed toward the Caucasus Mountains. This was another of those potential Persian weaknesses which Heraclius hoped to exploit. To the north of his invasion route through Armenia lay the kingdoms of Lazica, Iberia and Albania. You know them relatively well by now, as they were the source of the wars between Justinian and Khosrow I almost a century ago. The Caucasian buffer kingdoms were largely Christian, even if only Lazica was a Roman client. Heraclius had clearly made some attempt to cast his war as one of Christian versus pagan, and now planned to use that to gain recruits along the northern border. Heraclius had always been good at making alliances, first with the Moors, who had joined him in the civil war, and then Sergius and the other clergy in the capital, and now he would look to sweet-talk the Albanians. Their kingdom lay nearest to his army as they made their way from Ganzak up the various river valleys toward the city of Partor. Albania, being so near the northern Persian provinces, had been an obedient vassal state for some time now. Heraclius sent word to the various Albanian princes and noblemen to come and meet with him, And some did, but others locked themselves up in their mountain fortresses, fearing Sassanid reprisals if they cooperated. So Heraclius was forced to sack various Albanian towns to ensure that the population nearby would do as they were told and supply his army with what they needed. He set up camp in the town of Kalanketuk, if I'm even close to pronouncing that right. The emperor also released all of the prisoners he had taken during the campaign. Feeding them would have been a logistical nightmare. He may have also hoped that these people would return home eager to end the war and spreading news of the large Roman army that had cut such a swathe through their homes. As Heraclius prepared his winter quarters, his wife Martina gave birth to what I believe was their third child. Heraclius and his niece would have nine or possibly ten children in all, A lot of confusion surrounds the date of birth and the order of the children because many of them died while still very young. And while that could be because of natural causes, particularly while out on campaign, the Byzantines believe that several of the children were born with disabilities which made their survival even less likely. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, uh, the incestual union was widely understood to be displeasing to God and hence the unfortunate condition of many of their offspring. Incest aside, it adds a new wrinkle to our understanding of Heraclius' campaign strategy. Martina's pregnancy would have been evident while the army was sacking its way toward Ganzak. If the emperor had contemplated invading Mesopotamia that autumn, then he would have had to make provision for his wife to be housed somewhere, which would not have been easy. It's not a consideration I can remember any generals having to make during the history of Rome, at least that I know of. It's interesting to try and imagine what married life on campaign would have been like. Clearly, Heraclius valued Martina's company highly to insist that she go with him on this arduous journey. And we don't know if she travelled with him all the time or what kind of 
retinue or setup she had. It must have all been very stressful, particularly for her waiting behind during every military engagement, wondering what might happen if her husband didn't return. I shouldn't laugh, but historians can be a funny bunch. Walter Kagi's book about Heraclius has been an invaluable resource, particularly in passing through the sources to say what we know for certain, and all the hundreds of things we don't. But the professor hedges his bets a little too much, I think, when he talks about Heraclius's children dying on campaign, and comments that this probably upset him. Over the winter, Khusro ordered his leading generals to surround the Roman army while it was so nearby and destroy it. Heraclius had spread the imperial wealth during his stay and managed to recruit some Christian mercenaries from the Caucasus to join his army. But no sooner had spring arrived than word reached him that Shahin, Shavaraz and another Persian general, Shah Raplakan, were each leading an army toward him. This was the first of two crucial moments in this final phase of the war. If the three Persian armies could bring their strength to bear, they would easily outnumber the Romans. Heraclius' strategy depended on being able to have the largest army in every battle he fought. He was not Julius Caesar aiming to win stunning victories through bold manoeuvre. No, he was actually attempting to be Hannibal. One large army moving through enemy territory, making alliances and avoiding battle until conditions were in his favour. And he could not afford to be surrounded now. The force under Shah Raplakan was the first to arrive on the scene and began to retake Albanian towns and block any path into Persia. The Persian forces got the better of the early exchanges, and so Heraclius led his army west toward Lake Savan, as it's known today, or Lichnitis, as he would have known it. Shavaraz was now approaching from the direction of Lake Van, trying to block the path out of Albania, while Shahin was even further west, marching through Armenia. Heraclius' new Caucasian allies warned him of the potential for encirclement and advised him on how best to escape. The mountainous terrain would make it difficult for the Persians to coordinate large numbers of men, and if he acted quickly, Heraclius had a chance. This is some some of the most crucial dramatic battles in the whole of the last sort of 30 40 years of Byzantine history and unfortunately we don't have a Procopius or anyone like him to tell us exactly what they were like sort of like Maurice's campaigns um, of a few decades before Um, but we should uh, not forget how important these victories are Heraclius turned back and prepared to face Shah Raplakan On the eve of the battle, George of Pisidia has the emperor giving another inspirational speech, this time implying that eternal life would be waiting for those who fell in the subsequent battle. A very interesting suggestion for the times they lived in. Apparently he also sent deserters to Shavaraz's camp with false information about his location. Now, the war is filled with examples of this, of Heraclius using espionage in various ways and tricks and lies to help his cause. And and doubtless he did have good scouts um, because he always seemed to know where his enemies were and where he needed to go. But we've no idea how truly effective these plots that get reported are. We do know that many people in the Caucasus and Armenia were Christians and so may have favoured the Roman cause or as I speculated earlier, were just looking for cash, some financial compensation for their ruined farms. But we don't know if the emperor brilliantly deceived his enemies each time, or if he just managed to avoid them. Either way, Shavaraz did not link up with his fellow general in time, and Shah Raplakan's men had to face Heraclius' army alone and were defeated near Lake Savan. At this stage, Heraclius' army was well reinforced by the Caucasian troops and so would have easily outnumbered any one of the Persian armies. But turning west, the emperor got a stroke of luck. The Caucasian mercenaries were already threatening to go home if he ventured any further uh, from the Caucasus, and Shahin's army arrived only days after the important victory over Shah Raplakan's men. 
Now, Shahin had been pushing his men hard to try to link up with Shah Rukh Khan so that they could surprise and outnumber the Romans, but he was too late. And when their scouts found the Romans, Heraclius's men were now recovered, fresh from victory, and they immediately pressed forward to attack the newly arrived enemy. Shahin's army were exhausted from the long trek through the mountains and were now suddenly set upon and quickly defeated and driven off. These are very important victories which pushed the Persian armies away from where Heraclius was. He now moved south, hoping to reach uh, Byzantine Armenia, or what would have been that before the Persians conquered the whole area, so that he could use that as a base of operations and sort of more familiar territory to continue facing the armies. Remember, just because he's won a victory doesn't mean that the Persian armies are all dead in the field. They make a retreat at some point, and many of them will be able to regroup. However, he's now lost the, Laz- the Lazikans and the Iberians. Uh, the other Caucasian recruits leave him. They don't want to go any further south. And so the Byzantine army is alone. And when they cross the Araxes River, uh, Shahin's army has regrouped and they attack again. Um, they've set up camp, uh, the Romans, near a town, Vrenujnik. Again, uh, the Armenian place names are... Uh, causing me the greatest difficulty, but you can see that on the map. Shahin now presses to try and defeat the Byzantines, perhaps aiming to win some glory for himself without having to share it with Shavaraz. Again, this is a story that the Roman historians tell us, maybe not true at all, but it's possible. Shavaraz and Shahin, of course, had been the two leading generals in conquering all that Roman territory, and uh, perhaps Shahin felt Shavaraz was outshining him, and he could now press and attack the Byzantines while they they were weakened from the Caucasian mercenaries leaving. But again, Heraclius had chosen his camp very well, was able to deploy his whole army in formation, and the now uh, well-drilled and victorious Roman army defeated Shahin, and this time he routed badly, and his baggage train fell into the hands of the grateful Christian troops. The remnants of Shahin's force, including the general, link up with Shavaraz's army, but this was a crucial victory. Now, two Persian armies had been pushed aside, leaving really only Shavaraz's force that could stand up to such a large army. This was key. Heraclius would have been relieved. He would have felt things were going well. But, of course, he's still deep in enemy territory, basically, even though he's making for Armenia now, which is more familiar to him and lots of his men, and there are friends there. Still, he cannot afford to lose. He's not attacking these Persian armies with confidence. He is trying to outmaneuver them, stay one step ahead. Every day is a race to the next spot where he feels he can win a pitched battle. His men do have a winning formula, though. There is confidence. Uh, but they are heading forward. Heraclius has to reach Armenia, which is about a 150-mile trip from where he started, again through mountains and valleys, and uh, always keeping an eye on the horizon. Once the army reaches Lake Van, he builds a camp which he possibly felt could be his base for that year to keep campaigning from. If you again find Lake Van on the map, it was a strategic position which allowed him to either retreat toward Byzantium or cross the mountains to the south and invade Mesopotamia. But once settled into his new home, the emperor got word that Shavaraz was closing in. The general was lodging in the town of Arkesh, a little to the east, and uh, sent some 6,000 men to try and get ahead of the Romans and block their path back west so that he could surround them and create panic in the Roman camp. Once again, Heraclius was informed of what was going on. He's got those good scouts. He must have been you know, on the lookout for anyone he thought would know the terrain and could be trusted. And so seeing that Shavaraz had split his forces, he detached 20,000 of his men and sent them to go at lightning speed to Arkesh and try to drive Shavaraz and his army away. Now, if you'll recall, the Strategicon advised that night attacks could be effective against the Sassanids because their camps were not always as strictly organized as the Romans were. Sure enough, the Persians were taken by surprise by this sudden night attack, and Shavaraz was forced to flee, naked, according to one slightly implausible account, leaving his wives and baggage to fall into Roman hands. 
Again, not sure about <laughs> that story. I'm sure they did capture um, a lot of the uh, the Persian baggage train that was at Arkesh, but whether that account of Shavaraz running away naked, leaving his wives behind, sounds a little too good to be true. Um, but again, although this sounds like a brilliant victory for Heraclius, it did little to alter the military situation. Shavaraz's force had suffered only minor casualties and had fallen back to their reserve camp. They were just closing in at that point on the Roman position. And really, Heraclius could no longer maneuver within Persian territory. The Persians had now garrisoned all the passes that would lead him back into Armenia and Persia proper. And Shavaraz was keeping his army now at a distance, ready to uh, pounce should the Romans make a mistake. And uh, those victories had made you know, Shavaraz smart to the situation. So Heraclius was in a difficult position. He couldn't really continue campaigning without risking running into an army perhaps of equal size of his, but certainly that was now prepared for his tactics. So at this point, Still in the summer of 625, Heraclius decides it's time to return home. He needs to get his army back to Roman territory where he can be sure of his supplies and uh, come back for more the following year. He hoped he'd done enough damage for now. Khusro had ignored all attempts to uh, make peace, you know, after uh, each victory, Heraclius, if he could, would, you know, send a message saying we're still interested in peace, if you want to talk. No reply had come. And uh, so it was time to withdraw. But of course, withdrawing is no easy matter. Persian garrisons still occupy most of the cities that lay to the west. And Shavaraz is hovering, waiting uh, to watch what the Romans do next. And remember that, you know, if this is 40,000 men, let's say, um, there's no way to make a quick retreat. And we're talking about up being up in the mountains. So the whole army has to stay together. They have to negotiate areas that will make bottlenecks for the army going forward. They can only move at a certain speed. And of course, that means the Persians operating from their own territory have a significant advantage. They see the Romans going west. Now they can plan when to spring a trap or when the, the terrain will make the Romans weakest. Heraclius has to choose as well whether to march northwest or southwest. Those are the two routes home. The northern route was easier and avoided most of the Persian garrisons, but it was less well supplied. The southern route was harder and meant crossing the Taurus Mountains at strategically more difficult points, which again would expose the army to attacks from Shavaraz. But the emperor's primary concern was keeping the army together, and he couldn't afford for them to run out of supplies, so he began to march south because he knew the route better. He was more sure of the supplies available. This route was going to take him through former Roman territory, including past Amida and Martyropolis. But as soon as the army begins to move south, Shavaraz jumps into action. This was going to be a 200-plus mile trek back into Roman territory, and Shavaraz could find the time to pick his spot for an attack. Now, there are confusions in the sources about what happens next, where exactly the battle takes place. It seems like it was either very soon after Heraclius broke camp at the Nymphius River, or possibly much later on as he was crossing the Sarus River back into Roman territory. Either way, Shavaraz had got there first and destroyed most of the bridges that would be in the Roman path, leaving only one left. This would draw the Romans to it, and he had set up his army for battle on the other side of the river. Now, what happens next does come to us from Roman sources, so it seems likely, which is that despite being tired from their march, the Roman vanguard launches themselves over the bridge to try and drive the Persians away. Now, after a string of convincing victories, the Roman vanguard may well have thought, you know, we are now the premier cavalry force in the region. We can drive these men off. We've beaten them already. And they may have thought this was their best bet before Chavaraz decided to destroy this bridge. They needed to get across, drive him off. It would also follow the advice of the Strategicon, which is a kind of guide to what we think Heraclius was thinking, which says that if you make rapid charges against the Persians, you can avoid most of their arrow fire from doing its significant damage. But Shavaraz was no fool. This is the man who'd conquered the whole of the Near East and had barely lost an engagement with the Romans for a decade. 
He prepared a feigned retreat. As the Roman cavalry came charging toward him, his men turned and fled. The Roman cavalry pursued, and the Persians stopped and turned around and began cutting them down. Classic Persian tactics. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened next, because this is where George of Pisidia takes over with his 300 version of events. So he says, with the Persian army distracted slightly by chasing down the fleeing Roman vanguard, it was Heraclius himself who came to their relief, charging forward on his horse alone and making for the bridge. His surprised bodyguard follows him quickly. Standing on the bridge in his way is a Persian giant who the emperor felled with one mighty swing of his sword, sending him into the waters below. The Persian archers turn and begin firing, hitting the emperor several times, but like Boromir in Lord of the Rings, the emperor rode on, ignoring the sharp points sticking out of his flesh and armour, and made straight for the Persian lines, thrashing as he went. And Shavaraz looks at this scene and tells a renegade Roman who's now working for him, Look at your emperor! He fears those arrows no more than would an anvil. Stirring stuff, indeed, and presumably entirely fictional. Um, the battle itself is actually downplayed in some other sources, so we suspect that the Romans did suffer some sharp losses in this battle and had to use the full weight of their uh, superior numbers to force their way past Shavaraz and back on the route toward home. On that journey, they did get away from the Persians and were able to recapture both Martyropolis and Amida with little resistance, leaving small garrisons behind, and that would have given them some respite from the road. Heraclius also used these opportunities to send messengers the other way, back to the Roman lines to tell the people of Constantinople of the victories on the campaign and reassure them that he was alive and well and things were going according to plan. Of course, this was very much in Heraclius's wheelhouse, keeping the PR campaign going uh, to keep everyone on side and happy back home, fearing the worst. Apparently, Shavaraz did get ahead of the Romans again and destroyed bridges across the Euphrates and blocked key points, again trying to force them into a difficult position where they would expose themselves to attack. But the Byzantines successfully forded the river and reached the city of Samosata, and no other large battle is recorded, um, though clearly Shavaraz continued to harass them all the way because the Romans had no peace until they passed through Cilicia and back into Roman-held territory, finally reaching Caesarea before the winter of 625 set in. Phew. The army had been gone from home for about 18 months and marched over a thousand miles. They were in definite need of some R&R. &R. But the campaign had been a success. Heraclius had done some damage, shown everyone Persian weaknesses, and of course had kept winning. The Romans had lost every battle for 20 years between the advent of Focus and the campaign of 624, and there comes a moment when people would give up on the Roman state as being capable of defending them, and this campaign had given those people hope given hope to those still living under Persian occupation that the emperor had not forgotten them and he was on the move. I'm sure Heraclius was relieved and largely pleased with what he'd achieved, but as I said, no peace overtures reached him. He must have concluded that some hard campaigning was ahead and if he, if he was closer to the peace he desired, it was still only baby steps. As the winter of 625 sets in, the focus of our attention must shift to Tessaphon. As I mentioned, we don't have anything like a contemporary account of events from a Persian point of view. We have no clue as to how Khusro II was feeling. I feel a weird tinge of sympathy for him during this conflict. Remember that his father was killed by his own family to try and head off a rebellion by the general Baram Kobin. The general could not be deterred, and Khusro had fled into the arms of Maurice to get his throne back. When you are born the son of the King of Kings, I imagine your choices in life are actually pretty limited. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh yeah, poor little rich boy with all that power and wealth. But at the same time, when Khusro was back on his throne, the only thing people would compare him to was his predecessors. 
None of them had been put on the throne by the hated Romans. You can imagine that all he knew was people looking at him thinking, you aren't your father, you aren't your grandfather, you aren't living up to the great men of the past. It was almost inevitable then that he would go to war with Rome when Maurice was overthrown. It's tempting to hold these men to account over these fairly mindless wars. I still think Justin II is responsible for almost all of this by restarting hostilities when there was no need for it. But just like Justin, Kusro was in a world where emperors and shah and shahs felt they were judged by their victories against the great enemy. And in Kusro's case, his very right to rule may have depended on it. Once the victories began to rack up, can we blame him for wanting to keep the provinces he'd conquered? I think taking Syria and Egypt from the Romans was beyond his wildest dreams. After the initial burst of Sassanid energy back during the crisis of the 3rd century, I don't think many Persian monarchs had seriously considered the dream of reuniting the empire of the Achaemenids. Least of all Khusro II, when he was languishing in Roman custody. And yet now here he was, master of almost all the territory that Darius and Cyrus and Xerxes had once held. Can we blame him for his stubborn refusal to give up on that dream? Would he have forever been listening to whispers about his cowardice if he did a Hadrian and agreed some kind of strategic withdrawal for the sake of his empire's long-term health? With all this in mind, it should be no surprise that when the King of Kings surveyed the situation in the winter of 625-626, he did not conclude that it was time to make peace with the Romans. Which is, of course, an interesting counterfactual. Historian Mark Witto points out that Khusro's refusal to negotiate with Heraclius meant that the elites back in Constantinople remained firmly behind their emperor. But what if Khusro had sent word that he would come up with some sort of deal if they handed Heraclius over? Not at this point, after all the victories that the emperors won, but perhaps in the early 620s, it seems entirely possible that the King of Kings could have had his conquests ratified by the grateful Byzantines in exchange for peace. Instead, Khusro refused to consider the possibility and instead decided to mimic his enemy's strategy. If Heraclius could threaten to invade Mesopotamia and threaten the Persian capital, then Khusro would destroy Constantinople and bring the Roman state to its end. Even if an attack failed, it would hopefully draw Heraclius away from the border and allow the Persians to regain the dominant position they had held before the emperor went on campaign. The king of kings raised extra taxes and conscripted a large new army of any able-bodied men he could get his hands on. He also sent emissaries west to try and make contact with the Khagan of the Avars. Shavaraz was to lead an army back to Chalcedon and occupy the position just across the straits from Constantinople, while Shahin was apparently given 50,000 men and ordered to destroy Heraclius' army still encamped in Cappadocia. This was, of course, the second key moment in this final phase of the war. Heraclius had to make the incredibly tough decision of whether to return home and lose his threatening position on the Persian border, or to abandon his capital to its fate and risk being the emperor that allowed new Rome to be sacked and destroyed. The emperor chose to stay where he was, it might sound like a crazy decision on the surface, but Heraclius believed in his strategy. He knew he could not win Syria, Palestine and Egypt back through force. There was just no way. His only chance of restoring the empire was to threaten Ctesiphon itself and force the Persians back to defend their capital. If he left eastern Anatolia and his army was destroyed or outmaneuvered or ran out of provisions, he believed that the whole empire was doomed. As important as it was, Constantinople was going to have to defend itself without him. He did not leave them unguarded, of course. He broke off a detachment of his men and sent them home to defend the city. The sources claim 12,000 soldiers would take part in the defence of Constantinople, although the city already had a garrison, so not all of these came from Heraclius' army. Along with them went a letter detailing everything that Bonus should do to prepare the city for the coming siege. 
The walls should be reinforced at the foundations. Extra walls should be built, stakes placed in front of the walls, high towers constructed, and anti-siege weapons too, so that stones and arrows could be quickly fired back at the enemy. The fleet must be prepared, and every citizen should be given tasks to keep everyone fed and the defenders well supplied. I'm sure most of this was already being taken care of, but Heraclius was at pains to stress that his heart and mind were there in the city with his people, even if by necessity his body was elsewhere. Letters of encouragement from the emperor were posted in public places. Make no mistake, this was a very brave, courageous, risky, (laughs) dangerous decision. We can assume that Heraclius anticipated this possibility before he left, and he clearly saw no reason to change strategy now. Back in the capital, there were riots in mid-May, when the government tried to cut the remaining bread rations to the palace troops and charge for them instead. Every resource possible was being collected to try and prepare for the city's defence. Out in the Balkans, we don't know at what point word reached the Avars of Khusro's intentions. At some stage, Persian officials did reach the Kargan, but that may not have been until he was outside the city. It was doubtless communicated to him, though, by letter or other means, that he would have no better chance of taking Constantinople than the summer of 626. The Kargan duly obliged. By the end of May, Shavaraz arrived in Chalcedon. The city's defences had not been upgraded since the last time he'd occupied it. He took it with ease and sacked the surrounding area to make sure there would be no resistance. At the same time, the Kargan sent out word to the Slav tribes he considered his vassals, informing them that their services would be needed in Thrace. There are all sorts of details we don't know, of course. As the Avar horde approached Thrace, presumably thousands of people began to flee for the capital. But the city could only hold so many, and must have had to shut the gates. The Avar vanguard of about 30,000 men came in sight of the city around the 29th of June, 626. They had already begun to destroy parts of the western suburbs. Uh, On their way in, they wanted to create a physical barrier between them and the remaining terrified inhabitants of the area, and they wanted to cut those people off from the farms and forests that they planned on using to feed themselves. The Avar troops then cut the great aqueduct of Valens, leaving those in the city reliant mainly on on the giant cisterns. The aqueduct would not be restored for another 130 years or so. The Avar troops then began to build their camp opposite the Theodosian land walls. This included a palisade, a wall of their own to protect them from any sorties by the Byzantines. Once that was up, the engineers began to construct siege engines. Stone throwers, catapults and mangonels, wooden towers and tortoises, those wooden frames covered with hides that could be moved forward during an attack, Ten days after the camp was established, the Byzantine cavalry burst out of the city and attacked. Despite outnumbering the defenders at least three to one at this stage, the Avars were spread out across the three-mile stretch of the wall, and so an attempt to break through a weak spot and do some damage made sense. But the attack was quickly repulsed, and the Byzantines had to get back behind the walls before they were captured. Across the next twenty days, the army camped outside the gates probably doubled. Slavic tribes arrived and took up positions alongside the Avars, and of course the Avars were not one monolithic people. We hear reports that Gepids and Bulgars, along with various unidentifiable peoples, were being led down to Constantinople as part of a truly massive besieging force. By the end of July, the Avar Kargan himself began to approach the city. To try and understand what the siege would have felt like to the people inside the city, you have to forget that you know the outcome. And you have to forget that you know that the Theodosian land walls have such a fearsome reputation. Don't let that idea fool you when you think about how terrifying a sight this army was. The people inside the city had no idea how good their walls really would be 
when tested by a determined foe. We have reports of citizens who made their way up to the wall and were genuinely shocked by what they saw. Just the glint of the sun off the armour of all those thousands of men was enough to knock the wind out of you. And it was a hot July. Every day the water supply would get that bit lower. And to the people of Constantinople, this looked and felt like the end of the world. Although there had been attempts to attack the walls before, there'd never been a concerted siege like this. And to those people inside the city, they were all that stood between Roman civilization being wiped out then and there. I'm sure you've all heard discussion of what might have happened if the various Arab sieges of Constantinople had succeeded. With Byzantium falling in, say, the 8th century, would Islam have run right through the Balkans and into Italy? Would this sustained success have destroyed the culture that grew in France and Germany and Britain and so on that would eventually lead to the European and then the American dominance of our own times? This siege is not often mentioned in that context. But what if Constantinople had been brutally sacked and Heraclius's grief-stricken army had overthrown him? The Roman Empire might have been swallowed by the Persians, leaving them overstretched, the Persians overstretched, and facing constant rebellion for a, a decade or so before Muhammad's followers came sweeping through the Near East. Perhaps they would have taken the remnants of Byzantium right then and there, and the future history of the world could have been wildly different if the siege of 626 had been successful. As the Kargan approached his siege work, some of his men made their way round to Sikai, the suburb of Constantinople just across the Golden Horn. There they started signal fires to communicate to Shavaraz that the siege was about to begin. The Kargan did offer the Romans the chance to surrender, which was, of course, refused. The following day, the 29th of July, the assault began in earnest. For two days, the Avars prepared their siege weapons and bombarded the walls with missiles to try and soften the defenders up. Then, on the 31st of July, troops attacked the full length of the Theodosian walls. Apparently, the Slavs were sent in first, and then the Avars followed. They had no luck against the well-guarded high walls. The next day, the Kargan localized his attack and increased the use of siege weapons. The Avars bound their stone throwers together to give them better stability on releasing heavy shots. Bombarding the section of wall between the Gate of Romanus and the Gate of Rhesius. You can find all this on the map that accompanied episode 10, but basically that's the very middle section of the walls. A dozen towers were soon dragged forward ready for an assault once the bombardment ended. But these had to be pulled by mules, and as Belisarius found during the siege of Rome, there's only so much protection that you can offer these poor beasts. Once they were in arrow range, they were killed, and the attack failed. But the Avars still assaulted the walls anyway, and both sides suffered heavy casualties that day. The next day, August the 2nd, the Kargan, chastened, tried a different tactic. He asked for some Byzantine envoys to come out to discuss peace with him. Once they arrived, they found three Persian diplomats seated comfortably in the Kargan's tent. These men sat while the Byzantines were forced to stand. The Kargan offered the people of Constantinople a way out. If they all got on boats and left the city, leaving their possessions behind, he would let them live. They would be welcome across the Bosphorus, where Shavaraz had given his word to treat them kindly. Apparently, the Kargan closed with this. Your absent prince, even now a captive or a fugitive, has left Constantinople to its fate. Nor can you escape the Avars or the Persians unless you soar into the air like birds or dive into the waves like fish. But the Byzantines were unmoved. Inside the city, morale was, if not high, at least solid. The two days of successful fighting helped, but it was Patriarch Sergius who took the lead in keeping spirits up. He gave suitably rabble-rousing sermons about how God would deal with those who hurt his people, 
and then he led the other clergy on a daily procession along the walls, holding aloft an icon of the Virgin Mary. This was the celebrated Odehidria. If you come across that in a book, you might read it out as Hodegetria, an image of the Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus on one side and an image of the crucifixion on the other. It was said to have been painted by St. Luke himself and was so venerated that it had had a monastery built just to house it. Mary was viewed as the protector of the city, and soon tales emerged of how the Cargan and some of his men had seen a woman up on the walls and been perturbed at the sight. The Avars spent the next few days arranging for the next attack, and perhaps trying to convince Shavaraz to send men across the Bosphorus. The Persians were far more experienced at siege warfare, and the Khagan may have been seeking specialist advice, or he may have just felt the sight of Persians on the European side of the walls would unnerve the Byzantines. So far, of course, Shavaraz had sat twiddling his thumbs while the Avars did all the heavy lifting. There wasn't a lot he could do under the circumstances. The Persians had no Mediterranean navy, of course. They had only occupied some of that coast for the last five or ten years, not remotely long enough to feel confident in manning ships themselves. That means that if they had wanted to provide their general with the ships necessary to defeat the Byzantines, they would have had to recruit the crews from amongst the Roman-occupied population, and it seems obvious why they didn't try that. The Avars were no naval power either, so the only members of the besieging force with boats were the Slavs. As I mentioned back in episode 39, Neighbours and Provinces, the Slavs were highly skilled at fighting in and around rivers. When the Kargan called on them to join the siege, many had brought their monoxila with them, their dugout canoes. They had used these successfully before to raid imperial territory, and now were asked to put them to use. On the 6th of August, the Avars made a heavy assault on the land walls, and upstream in the Golden Horn, the Slavs slipped into the water and made their way down the inlet. We have several versions of what happened next. In one story, the Byzantines had captured the three Persian envoys as they tried to return to Chalcedon and discovered the Slavs' plans. The Slavs were waiting for signal fires to know where to land, and so Bonus led some of his men down to the shore, lit fires of their own, and when the Slavs raced there, they were slaughtered. The other story has the Slavs commandeering some larger ships and trying to escort several thousand Persian troops across the Bosphorus. The Byzantine navy caught up with them and sank the ships. It's hard to know exactly what happened but it seems likely that the Kargan would have attempted to use the sea, and even likelier that when a fully armed Byzantine Tromon, bobbing a meter or so above the water, came into contact with a couple of men paddling a canoe, the results were not good for the Slav seamen. <sighs> Control of the seas was key to Constantinople's survival, and in the siege of 626, it was never seriously contested. Back at the land walls, the Kargan launched a heavy and desperate assault over the next two days. Supplies were beginning to run low, and news may have reached him that Heraclius was very far from dead in the east. It was now or never if he was going to force his way into the city. This time he targeted the walls a little further north, around the area where the river Lycus flows through the walls into the city. This made the foundations there less secure than at any other point. The men who made those attacks must have been brave and hard, knowing what we do about the walls that they may not have been fully aware of until they jumped on them. This was an assault that was almost certain to end in death. First, they would have to cross the no man's land where they would come into the range of Byzantine arrow fire presumably hiding under tortoises or some other kind of shield, then splashed down into the moat or into the stream of the river itself, all while the arrows rain down on you and your unit. The muddy ditch you're in is presumably piled high with debris and dead bodies from previous assaults, and you have to use this and your discarded defenses to climb quickly over the first wall a few meters above you, 
Steel arrows rain down. The armor of the men around you can only sustain so many blows before they fall or scream out in pain. Now you're fighting actual defenders, though they quickly retreat to their towers when you swing your sword at them. But you're trapped on the first wall. Above you, giant towers loom with arrows and other missiles zooming down in your direction. For now, the sheer numbers of you attacking is keeping them busy, but one by one, Men are dying around you. You try to force the door of one of the towers, but it's blocked against you. Desperately, you try to climb up to the top of the outer wall, some eight meters above you. Arrows are still whistling past your hand and ears. With one foot on the doorway and another on a window, you manage to haul yourself up. Somehow, the defenders inside don't see you. They're too busy shooting out the other end. You make it to the top of the walls. Amazing. All around you is chaos. You realize you're the only one to make it that far. You look up at the massive inner walls, fully garrisoned. The men firing from it have been fighting in the east until now. They've spent every day for the last decade shooting targets. It only takes one of them to notice you, and it's all over. The assault on the walls was a bloody failure. The Kargan suffered heavy losses, and on the 8th of August, he ordered his men to begin to break off the siege. Some headed out to forage for food while others dismantled their siege equipment. Constantinople was seemingly impregnable. Theodore, Heraclius' brother, now arrived in the city from the east and may have negotiated a peaceful retreat for the Kargan. Officially, he claimed that he was calling off the siege because of supply issues, which probably was a contributory factor. He also snarled that he would be back, but he never would. By August 9th, the Kargan was gone, and all of his men soon followed. A short time later, Shavaraz too abandoned his position and made his way home. The failure of the siege was obviously a huge victory for the Byzantines. Psychologically, it was not only a relief, but a reassurance of Christian and Roman destiny. God had protected them and brought pain to their enemies. But it should be noted that there was no reason that it couldn't happen again, and many who lived through it doubtless prepared for the day when it might. But in the end there would be no return, as I just mentioned. The Slavs had suffered badly during the siege. The Avars took care of their own first, and being mainly cavalry, they were able to forage further than many of the Slavs could on foot. As the army began to disperse, Several Slav tribes sensed that Avar power was waning, and now was a chance to break their vassal status for good. It's murky stuff from a historical point of view, but it seems like over the next couple of years, the Slavs fought off attempts by the Avars to maintain control and slipped from their yoke. We can only imagine how anxious Heraclius was during this time. I assume he spent every spare moment scanning the horizon, demanding that every scout get him any scrap of information available about what was happening. His men must have been extremely agitated too. Remember that many of them had left home four years ago, and others had been gone for years before that. There was no way for them to go home, and they had a huge amount of time to dream about it. Today, when, say, the president declares war, operations can begin in days, these soldiers couldn't fight for four or five months every year during the winter, and some might have spent half their lives on campaign by now. How ecstatic must they have been when news came up the Black Sea coast of the successful defence. Their cause was still righteous. They could still win this and return as heroes one day. Heraclius must have said a thousand prayers of gratitude. His gamble had paid off for now. And the emperor had not been hanging around waiting for news the whole time. He had spent the summer on campaign. Or we think he did. Again, our sparsity of sources leave us guessing. Remember that Shahin had been given 50,000 men and ordered to destroy the Roman army. Well, the most common version of the story goes that Heraclius left his brother Theodore in charge of the main army and took a small contingent north with him on a special mission. Theodore and Shahin then met in battle, possibly somewhere in Armenia, possibly in Cappadocia. Apparently a hailstorm whipped up, which disrupted the Persians badly, and led to a total Roman victory. 
Some historians suggest that actually Heraclius stayed with the army and led it personally into battle with Shahin, as he'd done over the previous few years of campaigns. The hailstorm could be a complete fiction to add a clear bit of divine aid to the Roman cause, and it's not clear whether the raw conscripted recruits that Khusro had summoned went largely with Shavaraz's force or with Shahin's. Perhaps they contributed to such a stunning victory for the Romans. Coming up against the disciplined, experienced, and by now usually victorious army, perhaps it's no surprise at all. Whatever really happened, it was a major result, clearing the way for a potential invasion of Persia. Shahin either died in the fighting, or killed himself afterwards to avoid the shame of returning home defeated. As for the special mission that Heraclius was on, it seems more likely that this wouldn't have begun until the early months of the next year. The emperor wanted to make a new alliance in the Caucasus. Despite his string of victories, he was still losing men every day and needed allies to bring more pressure to bear on the Persians. North of the Caucasus peoples were the various Turkic steppe tribes, some of whom we've briefly met before. During 626, with the Persian armies all in the west, the Khazars, one of those tribes, had come sweeping down into Persia on a good old smash-and-grab raid. They had done this before, and so the emperor naturally saw them as ideal allies in causing as much chaos as possible in his enemy's backyard. In early 627, then, Heraclius sailed for Lazica with a few thousand men and arranged a meeting with the Khazar Khagan Tong Yabgu. They met at the city of Tiflis in Iberia, and when the Khagan arrived, he received an extremely warm reception. The emperor showered him with gifts and received him in the most luxurious surroundings that one could rustle up on campaign. This was the sort of treatment the Avar Khagan would have received if he hadn't attempted kidnap. And Yabgu was suitably impressed, for he offered his respect to Heraclius by kissing his throat, which would have made me nervous. But on the contrary, the two men sat down to a banquet together, happily enjoyed their time, and the emperor even offered the Khagan his daughter's hand in marriage. This was something of a staggering suggestion at this stage in history, given that a man like Yabgu was certainly viewed as an uncouth barbarian by the Romans. But Heraclius was willing to do whatever it took to restore the empire, and fortunately for young Epiphania, her betrothed would not live to see the wedding. In the meantime, though, the gifts from the Romans and the promise of more loot from Persia meant the Khagan pledged his army of perhaps 40,000 men to the emperor's cause. Again, very hard to know how exact these numbers are. The rest of the Roman army now made its way out to join the emperor, while the Khazars made merry havoc amongst the Persians. After assaulting both Tiflis and Partor to keep the local Iberians in check, the Khazars blasted their way through the garrisons guarding the passes into Persia. The bow-wielding riders of the steppe were still a match for any man. Yabgu himself left the Byzantines in late August and would die the next year. But some of his men stayed with Heraclius as he campaigned south into Persian Armenia. Whatever forces the Persians still had left were swatted aside with ease. By mid-September, Heraclius had yet another crucial decision to make. Having destroyed what little resistance was left on the border between Persia itself and Armenia, Heraclius could now invade Mesopotamia and press toward Tessaphon and the kind of peace deal he was looking for. The army left guarding the capital, as far as he could tell, didn't seem too impressive. And in fact, there was only one force left that could really stand up to the Roman army now. And that was Shavaraz's army. And this is one of the great questions of the last Roman-Persian war. Because something had happened between Khusro and Shavaraz. The fact that Heraclius could even contemplate marching into Mesopotamia means that he knew that the Persians' senior general was no longer going to help his king. And this is where our lack of Persian sources really hurts us. Because in some of the Roman sources, 
Theophanes, for example, writing centuries later, presents Kusro as having gone off the deep end. The king of kings was now mad with power. Having seized so much Roman territory, he was never going to give it up. And in one story, when he hears that Shahin has killed himself to avoid the wrath of his sovereign, he orders his general's body to be brought back to Tessaphon, packed in salt to preserve it, and then when it arrives, he whips it until it becomes unrecognisable. We just don't know if there's anything true in that story. It seems like Kusro is being painted as a true villain in order to make Heraclius seem more heroic. The story that comes down to us about what happened between Kusro and Shavaraz is in the same vein. When the king learns that the siege of Constantinople has failed, he sends a letter to Shavaraz's lieutenants, telling them to execute their general for his failure. But to get this message to the Persian army at Chalcedon, the messengers have to cross Anatolia, and are intercepted by Roman agents who seize the message. They bring it to Heraclius' brother Theodore, who, as you know, arrived at the capital just as the siege was ending. He passes the message on directly to Shavaraz. The general is obviously shocked and is about to turn against his king, but does a little editing of his own and adds the name of about 400 other senior Persian officers to the list of those to be executed. He then shows the letter to his men, who are outraged at their king's behaviour, and they all agree to follow Shavaraz wherever he leads. They depart from Chalcedon and head back to either Antioch or Alexandria and refuse to lift a finger in defence of Kusro. Now, in what happens next, Shavaraz does indeed stay in the conquered Roman provinces, provinces which he conquered, remember, and he allows Heraclius to invade Mesopotamia, or so it seems. Uh, we, we're pretty sure then that some something happened between him and the King of Kings. They did have a falling out. The story that comes to us doesn't sound entirely credible. Uh, First of all, remember that it's already claimed that Heraclius had put up letters from Kusro around Constantinople to stiffen public resolve that we suspect may not have been real, and that he sent false traitors to Shavaraz's camp to deceive him. So it seems like letter writing, tampering, and espionage uh, becomes something of a trope in the story that comes down to us. It doesn't mean that uh, all of these incidents are fictional, not at all, but it raises questions about the legitimacy of some of them. It it just sounds unlikely to me that Kusro would be so foolish as to order his general's death at a distance like that, Um, especially if Shahin and Shah Raplikan were already dead. If he was going to win this war, he couldn't go around executing good leaders. Maybe, therefore, it's a little more mundane than that. Heraclius and Shavaraz had fought each other at least four times now in pitched battles, and it would seem entirely in keeping with the emperor's character if he'd sent personal messages to the general offering him a deal, perhaps suggesting that the general would make a better king of kings, or pointing out that Kusro could not be trusted, or whatever it might be. Perhaps when Theodore arrived at Constantinople, he made some kind of deal with Shavaraz. And if that was the case... Who's to say Kusro didn't get wind of some rumours about all this? Within our own podcast, we saw that when Belisarius crossed the sea and conquered Africa and Italy, it didn't take long for word to come back to Justinian saying, hey, this guy is going to make himself king. You need to keep an eye on him. And, and this is a very similar situation. Shavaraz has taken Syria, Palestine and Egypt. A lot of the soldiers there are loyal to him. And any contacts he establishes with the Romans in those areas would be between him and and them, not between them and Kusro. So Kusro may have had very good reason to feel suspicion and fear at Shavaraz's power. And, of course, remember that Kusro had to flee for his life when he was young because a senior Persian general rebelled and marched on the capital. So I think he had a right to his paranoia. Whatever happened between the two men, their mistrust was to prove fatal in the end for both of them. So let's assume that Heraclius knows that Shavaraz isn't going to come to his king's aid. He still has to decide whether to keep going or not. Despite crushing Shahin's army and now sweeping the north clear of defenders, it's no easy road to Tessaphon. He's got to cross the Zagros Mountains and march several more hundred miles south to reach the king. <laughs> 
And even then he knows what happened to Julian. He knows that the Persian capital is a well-fortified city. And it's now winter. As you know, ancient armies did not campaign in winter. Because they needed so much food to supply themselves, it just wasn't practical to try and gather enough supplies as you were going. If you drifted too far from home, you could end up starving, you could lose all your horses if there were no pasture land, and as I said, there are still some soldiers between Armenia and Tessaphon, so if the Romans lose too many men, they might end up being defeated. Given all of that, why would the emperor risk marching on? which, as I've probably given away, he indeed did. I think Heraclius felt he would never have a better opportunity. With Shavaraz out of the way and the path clear, he felt he could do maximum damage right now. Who knows if Shavaraz could be trusted? Who knows if the Persians would spend the winter patching up their differences, or recruiting another army, or bringing men from the Eastern Empire? Or what if plague broke out in Heraclius's camp, or there was a coup back in Constantinople? So much can go wrong so quickly that if not now, when? Another thing to bear in mind is that Mesopotamia is modern Iraq. In other words, it is very hot there in summer. Many a Roman army had come to grief in the deserts of the Persian Empire, so maybe it was actually better to go there in winter when temperatures were bearable. Finally, I promise I will get to the actual invasion momentarily, but finally there is Edward Lutwak's theory that invading in winter was the key to Heraclius' plan. Now you've all encountered Edward Lutwak before. He was the one who argued for the defence in depth strategy during Diocletian's reforms of the army. He also supplied a lot of good information during the episode on the Strategicon. He's a military historian whose theories don't always find general agreement. But he argues that part of Heraclius' genius was creating a situation where the Persians would feel complacent. After each campaigning season, the Romans had had to flee Persian territory and find somewhere to spend the winter. Whether that was in Albania or by Lake Van or back in Anatolia. Wherever it was, they had to get home to find supplies. So even when in the summer of 627 they were laying waste the northern borderlands, Khusro could be confident that they would withdraw again as winter approached. Perhaps Khusro and Shavaraz hadn't fallen out irreconcilably. Perhaps Shavaraz was in Alexandria at the time and would have come to his king's aid had Khusro made him a deal. Lutwak argues that what Heraclius was doing was a high-risk, relational manoeuvre on a theatre-wide scale. You've seen plenty of relational manoeuvres during this war. When the Persians invade Anatolia, we saw Philippicus invade Persian Armenia in order to force the Persian army to come home and stop them. Your army's manoeuvre relates to the enemy's movement. The siege of Constantinople was a relational manoeuvre. Heraclius threatens the Persian heartland, so we'll threaten his and force him to back off. So now, Heraclius attempts this on a theatre-wide scale. Or in other words, the Persians have taken Syria, Palestine and Egypt. So how about Heraclius takes Mesopotamia? He takes Tessaphon. And then he will be able to swap them to get his eastern provinces back. Whether or not this was Heraclius' plan all along or the circumstances just presented themselves like this, we don't know. But as September 527 arrived, the emperor did not seek a home for the winter. He pressed on into Persian territory. When he reached the Zagros Mountains, just south of Lake Ermia, most of the remaining Khazars left for home. They were not fans of the wintry conditions, but it's possible that they left some of their hardy horses behind for the Romans to use horses who were used to spending their winters in cold steppe conditions. By now we suspect Heraclius' army was only about 25,000 men or less. He'd been fighting for five years straight with this force, so there had been plenty of erosion, though I'm sure recruitment did continue. But he'd broken off a number of units to go defend the capital and garrison various key cities, and I think we should remember that to maintain the high levels of training which the Strategicon-era army needed was pretty tough when you're constantly on campaign. 
So it's likely that this was just the core of the army. And it may have been designed that way, because to feed more than 25,000 men in enemy territory in winter might have been impossible. Kusro was shocked to see the Romans descending into Assyria, the territory just north of Mesopotamia, and dispatched a loyal Armenian general to try and stop them, Razatis in Greek, or Roch Vehan in Armenian, maybe. The Persian force was actually already north of the Roman army in Armenia, having also been caught off guard by the sudden move south. So they ended up chasing Heraclius into Assyria, and of course they found that the land had been stripped of provisions. Heraclius became aware of the army trailing him and crossed the Great Azab River. He would actually need to recross it to get to Tessaphon. But always aware that one defeat could be the end of him, Heraclius wanted to make sure that if he lost the upcoming battle, he could retreat west afterwards. He then went in search of the right battlefield, always concerned to pick the site of any pitched battle his army was involved in. His scouts found a plain near the site of Nineveh, the ancient Assyrian capital, near to the modern city of Mosul. The plains would allow him to use his full formation against the Persians. It was now early December, and when the two armies came into contact, the Byzantines took a couple of prisoners from a Persian scouting party. One of them claimed that 3,000 reinforcements were on the way, and when Heraclius heard this, he forced battle immediately, which suggests that the Persian army was large enough to be a threat, and that he feared that 3,000 more could tip the scales. At this stage, both armies were still moving. It seems like Heraclius was giving the impression that he was heading west, possibly making for home. But as soon as the Persians reached the plain, he wheeled around and attacked them. It was a foggy morning, apparently, the 12th of December, 627, when the two sides met. The fog aided the Byzantines in avoiding Persian arrow fire and allowed them to get in close for hand-to-hand combat. The veteran Roman army would triumph. The Persians did not rout, though. Despite Razatis being killed, they stood and fought all day, until night fell, hour after hour of exhausting battle. Credit to them, the Persians remained even after night fell, determined to guard their fallen comrades' bodies. But once darkness took over completely, they retreated to some nearby foothills, and the next morning the Romans were able to gain valuable armour from the dead on the field. The 300 version of this battle has Heraclius agreeing to fight a Persian commander in single combat, and then another two for good measure. Which of course is ridiculous on so many levels, especially the one where Heraclius took such caution over every aspect of the war. I always wonder whether anyone back in Constantinople believed those parts of the story. Did they just cheer along, knowing that it was all Homeric pantomime? And did Heraclius have to sit and listen, and nod along, saying, yep, that's just how it happened? I've put up an image of one version of the battle's aftermath, as Heraclius surveys Rosati's decapitated head. As with many battles in this war, it was not militarily decisive, The Persian force retreated in good order and went to link up with their reinforcements, but they had been badly damaged and the path was open for Heraclius to push further south. Strategically and psychologically, the Battle of Nineveh proved to be the last important battle of the whole war. The Roman army crossed back over the Zab and now moved south into areas which hadn't been touched by war for hundreds of years. Obviously, the Romans began to ravage the land and take what they needed to feed themselves. And this is another part of Heraclius' plan that worked out well. The uh, people of Mesopotamia were not expecting an invasion, particularly in winter, so they had not taken their supplies to defensible locations. Soon, panic spread amongst the people, who now began to turn on Khusro, who couldn't really do anything to prevent their suffering. And in a way, this was the decisive shift in public opinion that Hannibal had failed to achieve. Kusro didn't know at this point whether to run or stay where he was. He decided to remain in Tessaphon for the time being, perhaps fearing that if he fled he might encourage the rebellious noises. <laughs> 
Heraclius spent Christmas near the modern Iraqi city of Kirkuk. I know we think of Iraq as a place of desert today, but remember that along the river valleys, this whole area was very fertile, part of the Fertile Crescent. So Heraclius continued to find supplies for his men. Near Kirkuk, the emperor was greeted by the most senior Nestorian Christian in Persia. His name was Yazdin, and he helped administer the Persian land tax. And despite the doctrinal differences, it seems Heraclius got on very well with the Christians in the area, and may have gathered intelligence on events further south. It seems likely that Arab Christians were operating as scouts for the emperor, as the Persians were quite used to dealing with them, and may not have known who was working for who at this stage. Come January, the Romans moved south again. They continued to treat the countryside badly, hoping that refugees would now pour into Tessaphon and put pressure on Kusro. As they were moving south, the army came across Romans living in the fields nearby. These were people who had been taken from Edessa and Alexandria and settled here. Can you imagine how they felt? They were enslaved and taken hundreds of miles from home and presumably gave up hope of seeing Romania ever again. And then suddenly the emperor is standing in front of them. Amazing. On about the 6th of January, the army arrived at Dastagard. As we've sort of touched on already, the Persian kings liked to build palaces for themselves all across their empire. The Caesars had palaces too, of course, but the Roman Empire was a more urban place, so if the emperor went travelling, he would often have an imperial residence in a major city, or just commandeer somebody's grand home. Whereas you've seen from this episode, the Persian Empire had a lot of wilderness, desert, and mountains, and so to create a luxurious palace in the middle of nowhere was seen as a mark of the Shah and Shah's power. Dastagard was only 70 miles north of Tessaphon, about 50 miles from modern Baghdad, and was often Khusro's main residence, preferring to stay in palatial splendour than deal with any squalor in the capital. The Roman arrival surprised those inside, as many palace officials were captured, and the army were delighted with the other things they found there. The king had hunting grounds inside and magnificent gardens, so the men found pheasants, peacocks, ostriches, wild boar and deer, a very hearty meal for men used to rationing. They also found treasure, gold, silver, gems, silk, and in the slightly camp words of Theophanes, more linen shirts than one could count. Some of that treasure was doubtless taken from the eastern provinces, and most soothing of all to the Roman ego, they found about 300 legionary standards. Not quite the standards of old, when there were only 28 legions or so, but these were the unit flags, or standards, that I mentioned during the Strategicon episode. You know, don't run ahead of the legion standard. There's more confusion at this point in the story about what was going on with Shavaraz. One version of the story is that another fake letter was sent out, telling the general of a great Persian victory at Nineveh, so that he would stay where he was but it seems more plausible that he knew what was happening. Heraclius did send a letter to Kusro at this point, though, asking again for peace. He was more than happy to let the letter leak out to the Persian public to fuel their anger. In it, he says, I pursue and run after peace. I do not willingly burn Persia, but I'm compelled by you. Let us now throw down our arms and embrace peace. Let us quench the fire before it burns up everything. But no reply came from Kusro. So Heraclius burnt Dastagard and continued to advance on Tessaphon. But on the 10th of January, he came across the Narhawan Canal, which was in high flood, and had had all its bridges destroyed. Heraclius felt he had come as far as he could. He didn't want to end up like Julian, and so turned his army around and took a different route north to try and find some new provisions. He had to hope that he had caused enough havoc to convince Kusro that finally it was time for peace. He never could convince the king to end the war, but fortunately 
others did it for him. In a classic case of not learning the lessons of history, it was Khusro's own family who overthrew him, just as other relatives had his father. With the chaos inside Tessaphon, and possibly an outbreak of plague, the king's refusal to negotiate with the Romans became too much to bear. Again, there are lots of versions of the story. That Khusro had been executing people inside the city, that he demanded the population get ready to fight the Romans, or that he had tried to flee. Whatever the truth, his son Kavad was crowned the new king of kings as Kavad II. According to legend, Khusro was shot to death slowly with arrows after being forced to watch his other children executed in front of him. It's all pretty gruesome. I'm sure Khusro did his fair share of cruel things, and I can't say he was a lovely guy for warmongering or enslaving people, but his life story does read like some kind of Greek tragedy. The news that there was a new king in town reached Heraclius by late February. Sticking to the paths he knew, he had made his way back to Ganzak and set up camp there. He must have been thrilled to hear this, followed as it was by an offer of peace from Kavad II. Taking no chances, the emperor acknowledged the new king's right to rule and agreed warmly to begin negotiations. Of course, that's the official story, and certainly what Heraclius would have said publicly, but he was no doubt trying to get in touch with Shavaraz at this point. If he chose to be, he was effective ruler of the Byzantine East. In mid-March, Heraclius dispatched a letter to Constantinople declaring that the war had been won. However, he can't have been all that sure that hostilities had really ceased. He stayed at Ganzak until early April, by when Kavad's envoys had agreed to everything the Romans wanted. A withdrawal from all territory, payment of reparations, and the return of all Roman prisoners. However, Kavad had also sent word to Shavaraz that he should return home which the general refused. Heraclius's army now finally left Persian territory and headed for the city of Amida. There was some trouble there, and you can imagine this happening in various other places. The Romans had with them orders from Kavad for the Persian garrison to leave. But of course, they weren't going to fall for that old trick. Maybe they knew the emperor's penchant for forging letters. These particular soldiers were also Shavaraz's men, and so claimed that they didn't recognize the new king. The Jews and Monophysites inside the city were also agitating for the Persians to stay put, fearing reprisals from Heraclius's army. Eventually, the situation was settled peacefully, but tensions must have been high. No one knew what Shavaraz was going to do next. It's possible that he might have hung on to his new possessions, and Heraclius would have had to fight the attritional city-by-city war he had always hoped to avoid. But fate intervened. In September, Kavad II fell over dead, apparently of the plague. Outbreaks of the Black Death were only to be expected during this long and eventful war. If refugees poured into overcrowded cities, then it's highly likely that all the circumstances for Yersinia to succeed would be recreated. Kavad was about 38 when he died and was succeeded by his seven-year-old son, Ardashir III. The death of Kavad was very beneficial to Heraclius. He was now able to present a compelling case to Shavaraz that the royal line lacked legitimacy and various regents would now toy for a prize that rightfully belonged to Persia's most senior general. I'm sure Shavaraz knew that holding on to Roman possessions made him a target for both empires, and the most secure bet for him was to become king of kings in his own right, leaving a happy Heraclius in possession of all the former Roman territory. I suppose it's worth saying at this point that Shavaraz was not actually the general's name. His real name was Faroxad. The title Shavaraz was honorific, meaning wild boar, or boar of the empire, the boar having a Zoroastrian connotation with victory, as well as obviously referencing his abilities in war. Once again, we're at some confusion over what happened next. 
But it seems like in the summer of 629, Heraclius and Shavaraz met on the border between Syria and Anatolia and discussed terms. There is some suggestion that Heraclius wanted to marry one of his sons to Shavaraz's daughter and that the general's eldest son would accept Christian baptism. In exchange, the Byzantines would concede some very important border fortresses to the Persians. If true, it's an interesting confirmation of Heraclius' mindset. He had no intention of ever going to war with Persia again. He was willing to go to great lengths to make this alliance stick, and if he could, create a friend in the King of Kings. But what did and didn't get agreed doesn't matter. I'm slightly breaking with the chronological narrative to tell you that in the following year, Byzantine troops were sent in support of Shavaraz, who evacuated the Roman East, brushed aside the forces protecting Ardashir, and made himself King of Kings. But his reign only lasted about 40 days when he was killed by another faction inside Tessaphon. The Persian throne had already become quite the game of musical chairs, and the unhappy situation was set to continue for the next few years. Yet again, this was good news for Heraclius. Shavaraz's successors would not be Christians, but they would accept the Byzantine reoccupation of all former territory, up to and including Dara. Even Heraclius's return date to Constantinople is disputed, so muddled are our sources. But part of the delay was waiting for the true cross to be delivered by Shavaraz's men back into imperial hands. So at some point, possibly September 629, Heraclius allowed himself to go home. He didn't want to return to the capital without the cross Christ had been crucified on. He led treasures and elephants home from Persia, apparently, and there was many a tear shed when he arrived at the palace of Hieria, just across the Bosphorus, where his children, Constantine, Epiphania, and Heraclonus, were waiting for him. His triumphal entry into the city must have been the most amazing explosion of emotion in the history of Rome. It's hard to judge these things, of course, but having lost almost all the territory of the empire and enduring a frightening siege, the men and women of the capital must have wondered about their own lives, their own faith, and their futures on more than one occasion. But now their emperor was before them, triumphant, undefeated, and carrying the very cross of Christ with him. Can any emperor have been more popular than Heraclius was on that day? And I know it's easy to smile at the credulity of those who believed that this really was the same piece of wood that Jesus died on. But on this day, I think it would be easier than most to believe that God's power was real. Their world had been upside down, and now everything was right again. The celebrations went on for nine days. A special service was held in the Hagia Sophia, where the cross was raised up before the high altar. Special coins were minted to mark the emperor's victory, which you can see at thehistoryofbyzantium.com. The biblical story of David slaying Goliath was chosen to represent the emperor's amazing victory against the odds. The Senate voted him the title Scipio to go with the various august titles he carried, certainly a deserved honour given how he saved the empire from their lowest moment since the Battle of Cannae. Just to round the story off, in 630 Heraclius took the true cross back to Jerusalem. Again, the adulation of the crowds must have been an amazing sight to behold. One of our sources says, The sound of weeping and wailing, their tears flowed from the awesome emotion of their hearts and from the rending of entrails of the king, the princes, all his troops and the inhabitants of the city. No one was able to sing the Lord's chants from the fearful and agonizing emotion of the king and the whole multitude. This is definitely where Heraclius 300, directed by George of Pisidia, would end. He compares his patron to Christ on Palm Sunday, Jason returning with the Golden Fleece, and to Constantine himself 
rediscovering the cross. So ends the final ever war between the Persian and Roman empires. Although many of us think of it as those key six years of campaigning by the emperor, it's important to remember that the war had been going on for decades. The joy of people at its conclusion was a generation-long exhale. I hope you can see why I didn't want to break this story up into 30-minute installments. Heraclius' achievement of reuniting the eastern provinces while fending off the Avar threat is one of the great military achievements of the ancient world. And of course, if the rise of Islam is a convenient ending point, then it's the last great achievement too. At any stage of the campaign, if something had gone wrong, that could have been the end of the Roman Empire. At some point, After so many defeats, men might have accepted Persian domination. And if the Roman state had been broken, then it seems very doubtful that the line could have been held against the rise of Islam for another 800 years. With hindsight, Heraclius' victory could seem like a fairly pointless one, given what comes next. But I think one of the keys to good history is to do your best to ignore what you know is coming next. In those six years, Heraclius ended a war that had raged for 20 before it. As Walter Kagi puts it, the emperor showed a rare combination of excellent strategic and operational skills. He was very brave. He sacrificed a great amount. He worked incredibly hard. Through the historical fog, I think we're safe to say those things about him. He worked out the strategy most likely to bring him the best results, and he pursued it with every resource available until it succeeded. Would that we could all do that. To turn away from the great man side of history to more mundane practicalities for a minute, I think we have to ask why did the border between Rome and Persia stay fairly static between Crassus marching off to his doom in 53 BC and Maurice meeting his end in 602 AD? and then suddenly change rapidly back and forth after that. Clearly, there wasn't a lot to choose between the Roman and Persian armies. Each side was stronger at certain things, and most victories came down to one side having an advantage, either in size, discipline, morale, or battlefield conditions. And I think that's the key to the early 7th century period. Shahin and Shavaraz were good commanders, and when they started winning, they were always commanding the side with better discipline, morale, and I suspect size. Many of the best Roman soldiers were wiped out in the disastrous campaigns that took place while Heraclius was wrestling the throne from focus. The Romans could then no longer hold back the tide, because in every way the armies they had left were inferior to their opponents. But the pause which the conquest of the East allowed, meant the sides began to even out again. Many of the best Persian soldiers began to age out, and once Heraclius had a big enough army to take forward, he began to gain all the victories, and the best Persian troops were now being killed off. Soon the exact situation had been reversed, and Heraclius had the better motivated and disciplined force coming up against inferior, raw Persian soldiers. Don't let that fool you, though, into thinking that the Roman comeback was a matter of time. Negligence and civil war, together with the long-term effects of the plague, let's not forget that, had left the Byzantines vulnerable to this situation. The collapse on the Balkan front at the same time is something previous generations had been able to avoid. But the tide of Slavic migration, together with Avar power, had broken that. This really was the closest the empire had come to being destroyed since Hannibal's day. And it's weird to say that in a way, given that the entire Western Empire has by now disappeared. But of course we know that the Roman state went on functioning in the East, keeping alive the polity that was once a republic. If Constantinople had fallen, it's possible that the will to keep the state alive might have collapsed soon after. But it didn't, and for that, Heraclius gets the credit. It really is one of the great military achievements 
I'll have more to say about the Emperor when he exits the stage, but that won't be for another couple of episodes yet. For now, we leave him to bask in his glory and settle down for an incredibly well-earned rest. Our final image is of Heraclius entering Jerusalem with the true cross from the frescoes in the church of San Francesco in Arezzo. With the crowd's adulation ringing in his ears, I suspect he thought the hardest part of his life's work really was over. This story also underlines the genius of both Constantine and Anthemius, the Praetorian prefect who oversaw the construction of the Theodosian Walls. Without the building of New Rome and its giant walls, it seems likely that the East would have suffered far greater hardships or indeed been destroyed centuries before it was. I've also been thinking about what this story really tells us about the Byzantines. What is the message to take from it? And of course, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. But one thing that occurred to me is that this is a quintessentially Byzantine story. I've begun to use the term Roman and Romans a lot more since the episode on who is a Byzantine, because it only seems natural to call men who thought they were Romans by that name. But obviously, there is a difference in the two stories of the history of Rome and the history of Byzantium. And although that story ended with the fall of the West, I think the main narrative was about the brilliance of Rome's expansion. The heart of that story is about the principles and the work ethic of one city coming to define an entire continent and civilization. I think the Byzantine story is going to be more Sisyphean. You know the story of Sisyphus, right? From Greek mythology... He was a man forced to forever roll a boulder to the top of the hill, only to watch it roll back down again and start all over. Well, that in a way is what defines the Byzantine story. Justinian recovers western provinces against expectations, and the Black Death wipes out a third of his people. Heraclius uses all his strength to get that boulder to the top of the hill, and the followers of Muhammad appear almost instantly to shove it back down again. The Byzantines will spend centuries pushing the boulder painfully toward the summit, only to run into the Turks soon after. And when the Crusaders look like they will put their weight behind the effort, they turn out to be just as capable of shoving it back into a roll. You could look at that story and Heraclius' efforts as a great tragedy, a futile effort to see that boulder just tumble back past you. Or... You could admire the effort. Perhaps it's possible to see Heraclius as the first Byzantine to stand against the forces of history. Maybe the gods wanted that boulder to crush the Romans long ago, but they just keep pushing it back up the damn hill. (sighs) Cheese alert on, but you know who could really have used a good mapping service? The Emperor Heraclius. Now, he did very well with his local scouts, but I bet a Leatherman Data Services map would have been handy, right? Right? Yeah. So why not go bookmark LeathermanDataServices.com right now, just in case a project comes up in the future where you might be grateful for their services? All of us at the History Podcasters Network are very grateful for their sponsorship. And do check out HistoryPodcasters.com. I know, I know, you already listened to 17 history podcasts, but what about the special episodes that my colleagues have been creating? Collaborative episodes on topics like Terrible Leaders or Women's History Month. Go to historypodcasters.com and click on Our Podcast to hear them all. And finally, finally, I want to say thank you again for being patient and sticking with me. I just want to make clear that the big delay between this episode and the last one was because of my day job being overwhelming. Uh, There would still have been a delay even if this was only a half-hour episode, so don't blame Heraclius for my delays. When I last updated you on the situation, I said that come June, I would have more time for Byzantium, and here we are. But I also said I'd need to be loose with deadlines for the next while, and that remains true too. And I still aim to make the history of Byzantium the centre of my work life when I can. So a regular schedule 
will be back in place at some point. I hope to be back fairly soon with the next chapter in our story, as Heraclius gets a good long night's sleep before working out what to do now that peace has come to the East. <laughs>